Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Florence, um, and welcome to my talk, Why the World Needs a Vagina Museum. I just want to start really quickly by saying uh, some, you know, content warnings. I will be talking about vaginas. Um, I'll also be talking about some difficult and sensitive topics, um, including uh, sexual violence um, and FGM, and uh, so if uh, transgender issues as well. So if you would rather not listen to that, that's totally fine. And this is your opportunity to leave, and there's absolutely no judgment whatsoever. Um, it's family friendly depending on what your family's like. Um, but you know, and, and oh, you should know that there is a picture of a vulva at one point, because obviously. Okay, so, um, I launched the, the project to build the world's first bricks and mortar vagina museum because I found out that there was a penis museum in Iceland, but there is no vagina museum equivalent anywhere in the world. Uh, and I thought that was a bit unfair, as a bit sort of inequality on the nose. So um, there's only one way to change that, and that's to do it yourself. Uh, I was at a networking event once and I had one of those badges and it said Florence Schachter, Vagina Museum. Um, and this woman came over, said hello, and she looked at my boobs, which I'm normally totally fine with. And she was like, oh, what's the Vagina Museum? And, and her friend had to be like, darling, no, it's what you thought it was. Because people are just so like, they don't expect to see the word vagina in a public space. And I've had some really weird reactions uh, to the Vagina Museum, and I'm going to show you a few of them, um, just so you kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, so obviously a lot of them are quite nice, you know, I'm not going to say, uh, show you many of those because it might be a bit braggy. So I'll show you the ones that maybe are not necessarily nice, but more jokes. Um, there's this one. There's a building in London dedicated to crusty old cunts. But enough about Parliament. There's a vagina museum too. <laughs> I get this all the time. So many variations. The Republican Party, the House of Lords. And it's funny the first time you hear it until you really think about what the crux of the joke is. The, the crux of the joke is that cunts, vaginas, vulvas are bad things. That's the joke. And they're comparing the people they hate to other things they hate. Vaginas. Um, but I mean, not all of them are quite so sinister. This one's quite nice. A vagina museum's coming in London. Officials caution that while crews work to respect warning signs and tour guide instructions, caution, slippery when wet. <laughs> Which is um, much better than the endless jokes of, will it be closed once a month for refurbishment? No, no, it won't. It's still gonna be open and it's gonna be even better. Um, we've even caught uh, international attention. Um, I'm very short on time for this topic, so uh, for this talk, so I'm not going to show you all the videos. But like Conan O'Brien um, mentioned us in his uh, monologue, which was really exciting. Um, and he made a joke, obviously, but he did make this joke, and I'm very proud of that, which is, you know, I bet I can't find it. A vagina museum, bet I can't find it. Which is interesting, considering there is a flower literally designating its location. Um, but of course, they don't actually mean the vulva. What they mean is the clitoris. You know, the vagina museum better have a knocker on the door because no man will be able to find the buzzer. Apparently, there's a clitoris museum very near the vagina museum, but I could never find it. I hate this joke so much because it is so easy to find. It's right there. Just, 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 it's right. <sighs> okay. Okay, that's the only photo in there, don't worry, it's gone now. <laughs> um, you know, and we get all sorts of jokes. I promise you, there is not a joke you could tell me that I haven't already heard. Um, also, there's a lot of um, journalists, for some reason, who really hate the existence of the Vagina Museum. People's like, why so many genital-related PR requests? I, I don't know why they're so upset. That sounds great. Um, and then people use it as a way of making personal commentary. For example, here, Florence Schechter, a particularly loopy British feminist, is fundraising for a vagina museum. I, I like the fact that they called me loopy. If you look in the um, preview of the article, they also call me a YouTube star. I'm a feminist YouTube star. Oh, they're actually complimenting me. It's real backfire. Um, and, the, you know, the per
personal commentary never ends. You know, if, did you know if you say a weird idea out loud around Florence Schechter, there's a 50% chance she'll do it, referencing the Vagina Museum. Um, I don't know this person. Uh, this was a complete Twitter egg. But damn, did they peg me. Oh, about a year ago, I broke my foot and I was in Brighton um, and I was walking around with like one uh, trainer and one slipper and some friends of mine that evening were like, we should go clubbing. And I was like, I have, I've literally got a broken foot and I'm walking around in a slipper. Yes, of course I'll go. And that is a picture of me in a club in a slipper. It's, it's just something off my bucket list. Um, and then sometimes it isn't necessarily personal commentary for me, but for other people. Um, I won't read the first one because oh, whenever I read it, I always feel gross. Um, and then, you know, somebody says, this sounds like a project the Trump administration might want to grab. I've heard so many Trump jokes, I can't handle it anymore. Um, yet that person agrees, my little baby, it's just can't deal with Trump anymore. Um, but then it's not always fun and games. I get quite a lot of people who uh, don't like the fact that we're gender inclusive. So this is an example um, of somebody who replied to us sharing a poster of an art exhibition we did in Edinburgh, um, where it was something like, um, you know, art exploring people's relationship with their vaginas or something. And somebody said, why have you used the word people instead of the word women? And I thought that was really interesting. I didn't say this to them, but I was like, don't you consider women people? Um, but yeah, I, it's just a fact. There are people with vaginas who don't call themselves women, and there are people who are women who don't have vaginas. That, like, that's just literally a fact. Like, there are people out there who do that, and I think it's very arrogant and hubristic to tell somebody else, you know, actually, I'm going to define you. Actually, I get to decide who you are. Um, and then... This, this happens quite rarely, actually, rarer than you'd expect, but there is always the mansplaining. This is indeed a real email that I, uh, I received. Um, I blacked out the name because I don't want him to be embarrassed if he ever comes to my talk, but also he is absolutely going to be embarrassed. Um, where he says, you know, I heard about your idea and here is the suggestions of things that you might want to include. And then he gives me a number of suggestions, including things like the vagina monologues. Like I hadn't heard of the vagina monologues. Like I'm opening a vagina. I was absolutely astounded. I'd literally heard of like all of these things except for maybe one, which was just a recommendation of a very specific researcher. And, um, so I was far too nice, to be honest, and I was like, oh, thanks, I knew about these, but I'll keep them in mind. And then he sends a follow-up email <laughs> where he says, I had some more suggestions. And this is his real list. He suggested I include photos and illustrations. Mm -hmm. Information. If, if history. He suggested I include history in a museum like I didn't know what a museum was. It was really astounding. I mean, oh. but hashtag not all men, um, because obviously you're wondering, what did my father think? That's what I'm always wondering. Oh. Um, but after the, uh, that was way too dark, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've never made that joke before, but I'm definitely writing it in. Okay, anyway, after the uh, first, um, after the, oh sorry, I just realized I didn't put my timer on. Okay, um, after the first article was published, he sent me an email, and this is the email he sent to me. He said, oh, I click one thing and it all stops working. There we go. He says, hi Florence, I read your article in The Independent. You've hit the G spot with this interview. Oh, <laughs> oh my father is one of a kind, he really is. Um, but of all those reactions, there are some reactions that really prove to me why we need a vagina museum so much. And it's things like this. People saying, let's open or close your vagina museum instead. The world needs lots of things, but a vagina museum isn't one of them. Now, I obviously disagree with this. And so I thought maybe I would make the case to you. Why does the world need a vagina museum? Now I'm about to talk about some very difficult topics, 
and then I'm going to tie them all at the end. So please bear with me. This bit is about to get a bit depressing. Um, I normally uh, start this section of the talk by showing you a video. It's called uh, My Clitoris. It's a song uh, by a charity called Integrate UK, which works with victims of FGM in the UK. Um, it's a really great song, and I'm going to play it at the end for us to all, like, you know, exit to. It's a really great song. So why do we need a vagina museum? What is the history that we need to learn about our vaginas and everything that goes with that? What is happening right now in the world that we need to be learning? Here, for example, uh, retake the night um, type protest. About one in three women will experience sexual violence or sexual assault at some point in their lives. In some countries, that is as high as 70%. Child marriage is still occurring in the world. All over the world, there are uh, more than 700 million women who are alive today who were married before their 18th birthday. And this woman is one of them. Her name is Angel McGeehee. Uh, this is a photo of her on her wedding day when she was 13 years old in Idaho. In the US, uh, the legal age of marriage is mostly 18, except for two exceptions, where it's 19 and 21. If you have parental and judicial permission in 25 of those states, you can get, as mar you can get married as young as 13, no, as married as young as 11. In the other 25 states, if you have parental and judicial permission, there is no minimum age for marriage. There are over 200 million people alive today who have undergone female genital mutilation. It is a problem that happens mostly in Africa, but it used to happen in the UK. Um, until very recently, maybe 100 years, um, clitoridectomies, the removal, surgical removal of the clitoris, was quite a standard uh, treatment for anything from masturbation to epilepsy to almost any mental health issue in a woman. Today, women and girls together account for 71% of all human trafficking victims, and nearly three out of four trafficked women are trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Does anyone know who these people are? Heads of state, yes. It is every head of state or head of government in the world as of when I last updated my talk. Um, so you can see, for example, you know, there's Theresa May, who I can't even think about now because every time she pops up in my head, she's dancing and my brain wants to just die. Um, there is, you know, Angela Merkel, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, the New Zealand president, uh, which is the bottom second from the left. She is amazing, by the way. If you haven't heard of the New Zealand Prime Minister, Prime President, Prime Minister, I'm not sure. Um, she recently came back from maternity leave. It was she went on maternity leave while she was the head of state. And um, when um, she was having her like election campaign, people asked her, what, what, what happens if you go on maternity leave? What happens if you get pregnant? You're a young woman. And she was like, yeah, I'll just go on maternity leave. Like New Zealand won't crumble. Like, you realize the government isn't entirely run by one person, it'll be fine. And talking of governments, there are still over 70 countries in the world where, is it, where it is illegal to be gay or to be LGBT. 12 of those still carry the death sentence. Um, I was in the United Arab Emirates, just, I was working at the science festival and I was in the hotel, and United Arab Emirates is one of those places you can get flogged for, if just for being suspected of being gay. And we were sitting at a hotel, and a, a local man, he was sitting on another table, and he just interrupts our conversation, he goes, um, can I ask you something? Why do you have beards? And there were two men there who had beards, um, uh, two of my friends. And they were like, I don't know, it's just, it's just a fashion at the moment, we're just, that's just what we're wearing. And he was like, I think you're wearing beards. I think you have beards because you want to show how masculine you are. You want to show women that you're like a good, strong man. You know, you're definitely not one of those gays. And to his credit, one of my friends just stopped him and said, well, I know that can't be true, 
because I have a beard and I'm gay. And I was so impressed with him in that moment because this local, the way that country works, that local literally could have, get him, could have got him flogged and deported for that single comment. He's okay, don't worry, by the way. On an average day, talk, talking of, of um, you know, legal repercussions, on an average day, I do at least six things that would be illegal for me to do in another country just because I'm a woman. Things like cycling to work and leaving the house, very recently driving, someone just motioned to me the driving. Very recently in Saudi Arabia, they allowed, they, they let women to start to drive. Um, some people are saying it's a cover up for some other things that was like a distraction thing, but like at least it happened, I guess. But until very recently, in Saudi Arabia, women could fly planes, but they couldn't drive cars. So women, they would be driving this humongous pl plane, they'd like land the plane, and then they would have to get a chauffeur and a taxi to their hotel because they weren't allowed to drive the car. It's, I beg as a belief. If you want to find out how many laws you break every day just for being a woman, and you can do it even if you're not a woman, you know, it just says if you were a woman, um, that is the URL. If you just Google, like, Match International. So, but what will the Vagina Museum do to tackle these issues? The world is shit. Yes, the world is totally shit. But I really do believe that a Vagina Museum can be one of those things that can help turn the tide of the world. We'll have permanent galleries, exhibitions where we can learn about the issues that I've just discussed. Because m most of the time, these issues are swept under the carpet. They're taboo. Like, you know, when they're brought up, people don't even want to talk about them. And by having an exhibition, you can go there and you know that it's a trusted source. You know, there are people to talk to and people to ask questions. And that, I think that's why exhibitions are so important, why permanent collections and museums are so important. Because they're a way of society telling itself what they deem important. We'll run events, um, which is basically another method of learning in a different format, because not everyone will enjoy exhibitions, but also we'll have events like comedy nights, because we have to laugh sometimes. We'll be doing outreach work. This is really important, the outreach work that we do, collaborating with other charities um, to do things like distributing menstrual products to the homeless, to refugee, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, to people in period poverty, um, outreach work like working with cancer sufferers. Uh, tomorrow is Gynae Cancer Awareness Month, by the way, um, because I just feel like you can't come to the Vagina Museum, learn about how shit the world is, and then just have no follow through. You have to be able to like channel that anger and frustration into doing something good. And policy work and advocacy is a big part of that as well. So making policy recommendations to make sure that our government is protecting and furthering our rights um, and doing awareness campaigns and things like that. And then of course there will also be a gift shop uh, because it's a museum and a cafe with vulva cupcakes because I mean, come on, we need, don't those look delicious? I, oh yes. I went to an event at the Feminist Library where we made vulva cupcakes. I made my first ever vulva cupcake and it was just the best. I highly recommend, they're so easy. So I decided to make a vagina museum. That's what I did. And this is the actual tweet where I decided to do that. And you can see it dated 20th of March, 2017. It really wasn't that long ago. Where as a joke, I said, people, there's a penis museum in Iceland, but no vagina museum anywhere. Who wants to start one with me? And then I retweeted myself because I'm that kind of person. And I said, oh, I tweeted this on a whim, but it's, it's actually a life goal now. So what would the vagina museum look like? That, that's the bit I kind of lie awake dreaming about. What will be in it? So there's gonna be four permanent galleries. This is the current plan, it may change. It takes a really long time to build a museum. This is what I've discovered. So the current plan is society, culture, uh, uh, um, wait, sorry, science, culture, society, and history. There we go, because that's the order that I'm doing them in the slides. So science, uh, I thought would be a fun one to start with. So there is so much misinformation about the gynecological anatomy out there, so I thought it would be a good place to start. It's a good sort of starting point. And to show you how much misinformation there is out there, I thought I might show you a, uh, something that went viral a few months ago. This is a post from Kyle. 
Do women actually orgasm? There is no conclusive physiological evidence of it. Men are very clear, obvious, but women, not so much. Mm, I have to disagree. One thing is clear. Women are taught that they are supposed to orgasm. Are we? Where? I need to go to this place. Perhaps it is an unreasonable myth. That would help explain why so many women are sexually unsatisfied. I think we all know why women are sexually so unsatisfied in your life, Kyle. <laughs> Perhaps because they are expecting some defining moment like men have. Maybe a woman's sexual experience is just totally different from a man's. I will study the issue further. A true scientist. I really don't think he is going to study the issue further, to be honest. There is so, like when I read this, I was absolutely astounded that any person could think this. I didn't even know where to start. And not knowing where to start is something that's quite common in this country. Half of 26 to 35 year old women in the UK cannot label on this diagram which one is the vagina. Can, anyone want to give it a go? It's okay. I'm just going to show you really quickly. Camera, I'm going to go out of shot for a second. <laughs> it's that one. That's the vagina. Cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, ovarian tubes, actually. Ovaries. I don't like calling it the fallopian tubes because Fallop Gabrielle Fallopio, who is named after, was an absolute dick. <laughs> if you want to find out why, I have the most hilarious story about him um, when we do the Q&A afterwards. Um, so, uh, da -da the misinformation is having real impacts as well on people's lives. So, in child, does anyone know this show? This is called The Midwife. It's an amazing show, makes me cry every single episode. It's really cathartic. Um, but the reason I brought it up is because tears during childbirth are on the rise in the UK. And the Royal College of Midwives was trying to figure out why this is. And they came to the conclusion that it is TV. I know, another, another reason why TV is the worst. Um, but because, imagine this, you're giving birth. It is an extremely stressful situation. You're not really listening to people. You're just kind of, you know. And when, when you're in that kind of situation, you just refer to what knowledge you already have. What is almost the only experience we have as modern people of childbirth? It's from TV. And what do people do on TV? Push, 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 push. But when you are crowning, which is when the baby's head is coming out of the vagina, you don't want to push that hard. You actually want to push really slowly because that's the bit when you're most likely to tear. You've got to take it really easy. And the only show I've ever seen who has, who has shown childbirth accurately is called The Midwife. Um, so, you know, we should commission the next season, is all I'm saying, if anybody works at the BBC here. But all of this information is even not enough, because not everyone fits in to the current information that is available. So, I don't know if anybody recognises who this is. Uh, this is Lady Colin Campbell. She is particularly famous for being, I'm a, being on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. She wrote books about Diana or something, because she's a posh... English white lady, and that's what posh English white ladies do. Um, but the reason I bring her up is because she wasn't actually born a lady. Um, she was born um, as a... So she was born, when she was born, she was born in Jamaica in the 1960s. I'm just referring to my notes to make sure I get all the facts right. And she had indeterminate genitalia, as it's called. She had a f fused labia and a deformed clitoris. I'm only using those words because that's what was in the medical notes and has been reported to me, and that's as much as I know. And her parents were given the choice by the doctor. You can either raise them as a girl, and I'll do the surgery, or you can raise them as a boy, and I'll do the surgery. So, of course, being posh white English people, they were like, yeah, boy, of... But when she started going through puberty, she was going through a sort of like very female puberty. 
she, you know, her hips were expanding, she was developing breasts, and they realized that they had made the wrong choice. And she agreed with them. She never felt like a boy. And it suddenly all made sense. And so what they did is they put on hormone blockers so she would stop becoming a girl. And when she was 18, she transitioned and she now lives as a woman. Um, she's only called Lady Colin Campbell, but not because like Colin is her old name, but because just like posh English people, they take their husband's name in full, you know, like Princess Michael of Kent. This kind of surgery is called um, uh, normalization surgery normally. It is currently banned or restricted in three countries and one US state very recently. Does anyone know which countries they are? Malta. Malta, yes, that's like the first person in the audience who's ever got that right, well done. Malta is super great, it was the first one, really random. Does anyone know the other two? It's um, Chile, where it's banned, and it's restricted in Colombia. And in the state of California, they've condemned it, but I'm not really sure what that means yet. We'll see. Um, and then once you start having your, you know, you start learning about your anatomy, you start learning about menstruation, of course. And this is a real thing that went viral. A person tweeted saying, tampons should not be free. Why does everyone keep saying they should be? If you can't control your bladder, then that's not the taxpayer's problem. I know, that's how much misinformation there is out there about our bodies. There are real people out there who do not understand how periods work. You'll be very pleased to know that after this tweet was sent, his girlfriend dumped him. <laughs> yeah. And with menstruation comes, of course, the terrors of puberty, unless you're Neville Longbottom. Um, oh, just, I only put that photo in there for my own gratification. Um, and then with puberty comes, of course, the possibility of pregnancy, uh, which is another really important thing to learn because it's, su it's such an important thing in our society, you know, that there are so many myths about it. You know, if the baby sits high, it'll be a girl. If the baby sits low, it'll be a boy. There's so much misinformation. Um, so much information, misinformation. For example, this was a real ad where a person, these two people were checking a pregnancy test like they did, the tagline is, when you want to be sure. Like, we, you don't need, oh God. But of course, not everyone wants to get pregnant. And, um, oh, it skipped, okay. Not everyone wants to get pregnant. And there are, people go to great lengths to not be pregnant. One of the ways, just an example, is, um, it's called God's loophole. So the, 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 thing, the image that I've shown you is a comedy song by Garfunkel and Oates that is all about this loophole, where basically in um, America, there, uh, there is a lot of abstinence-only education. They're not learning about contraception. Um, and this leads to a huge misunderstanding on how these sorts of things work. So God's loophole is the idea that losing your virginity is penis goes into a vagina. So how do you keep your virginity? Don't put it in the vagina, put it next door. And that is God's loophole. Problem is, is there are all the associated risks of unprotected sex, and they're not learning about that. All they're learning is you shouldn't have sex, and for them, sex is penis and vagina, and STIs are on the rise, basically. And even when we're getting sex education, it's often very poor sex education. We're not learning about things like consent, so this is a still from um, the Thames Valley Police uh, video about tea. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It's now compulsory in all schools. Um, and of course, once we've gotten over the sort of baby making years, there comes menstruation, uh, sorry, menopause. Um, why did both those words begin with men? I really don't like that. Um, basically, um, menopause is kind of the reason why humans are so great. Um, and if you want to find out why, uh, we can do that afterwards because I don't have enough time. Um, but of course, that is a very heteronormative point of view. And, oh, wait, before, the sex. Uh, I was going to say a thing about sex. Basically, women have less orgasms or fewer orgasms than men do. Um, heterosexual women, 61% of the time, 
they will have an orgasm during sex. For lesbian women, it's much higher, of course. But for bisexual women, it's even lower than heterosexual women. And I don't know why that is. No, further studies are required. But that is, again, sorry. So everything previous has been quite a heteronormative point of view and learning about LGBT issues are really important, especially the inf like the just actual information behind it. Because there are real people like this who try to prove that same-sex attraction and being LGBT is unnatural. And you know how he proved this? He did it with magnets. He got, an, got two magnets and he was like, look, north and north, they don't like to go together. But north and south, they attract. Therefore, being gay is wrong. <laughs> I know, a beggar's belief. And of course, that's to do with attraction, which is very different to gender identity, which people have been gender non-conforming literally for millennia. We have su such early records of people not conforming to the gender binary, um, including, for example, much more modern versions. Does anyone know who this person is? Violet Chatsky, who I just wanted to share this image of them because um, they are modeling this new lingerie range and they look way better than I would in this underwear. And I, I think that's something to be celebrated. <laughs> um, and of course, because I am a scientist, um, the research of the gynae anatomy will be something that's included because that is has a very checkered history, including its study of animals. And the um, mascot of the museum would probably be the hyena. Again, if you want to know why, come ask me afterwards. It's the hyena is amazing. Um, there will be the, so, so that's the science one. So I thought I'd labor over that a little bit because I think it's a really good starting point. And now I'm gonna just quickly race through the other three galleries. So there's the culture gallery where we will show images, um, you know, examples of art, uh, paintings, sculptures, music. Janelle Monet's Pink will just be on loop constantly. Um, books, plays, things like um, George O'Keefe. The flower series, I don't know if any of you have seen the flower series, it's a whole range of paintings of flowers and they look like vulvas so much. Every single one of them looks like a vulva. But to this day, her and her estate, because she's not with us anymore, always said, it's not a vulva, get your mind out of the gutter, it's not a vulva at all. And I find it really interesting why they said that. Did they say that genuinely because she was painting vulvas? Or was she like, it's 1926 in America, but homosexuality is illegal. Of course it's not a vulva. Who knows? We'll have exhibitions on books like The Hammes Tale, which I think is one of the greatest books about the gynecological anatomy. And um, of course, more, more modern art as well, like The Great Wall of Vagina. Um, the artist has already agreed to sell it to me once uh, we have enough money and space. Um, and I only keep saying that so that he keeps to his promise. Um, <laughs> It should be called the Great Wall of Vulva. I totally admit this, but then it wouldn't be a pun. And I think the pun is way more important, guys. The Society Gallery. So the Society Gallery will explore cultures and all cultures around the world and how they have explored the gynae anatomy. For example, religious rites. This is an image from the annual festival in Assam in India, which celebrates the goddess Shakti's annual menstruation. Very jealous, only once a year. It's amazing. Um, the myths and legends that our society has about vaginas, for example, vagina dentata. <laughs> what a wonderful phrase. Yes. I'm, I'm going to write that song. <laughs> um, you bring up Disney. Do you, you know the movie Moana? Um, I'm going to assume you do. Um, you know The Rock's character, Maui. So in the original Maori mythology, do you know how he dies? It's the best story. He basically, he's a bit of a trickster, and he wants to get the secret to immortal into, for immortality. So what he does, this is his plan. He goes to find the goddess of death, and his plan is to climb up her vagina, exit through her mouth, not sure how the biology works on that, um, and be, by reversing the process of birth, he will then be able to prevent death. And so he waits until she's asleep, and then he gets, she's a massive giant, and he starts crawling up her vagina, and on looking is a bird. 
And this bird finds this scene so hilarious that they start laughing, laughing hysterically, so loudly that the goddess wakes up. And she's like, Maui, what the fuck are you doing in there? And so what she does is she activates her obsidian vagina teeth and crushes him to death. <laughs> yeah. So I really think it's, it's, the, it's the Me Too story of the ancient world. Um, <laughs> Myths and legends, indeed, will have exhibitions on the language that we use. For example, this is just an image from a book called Colourful Cocks and Quims, which if you buy it, all the money goes to FPA. So, you know, always a good shout out for them. Um, eg uh, exhibitions on sexuality and sexual oppression. I think maybe chastity belts might be one, or not necessarily in origin, because vagina dentata happened before, definitely before chastity belts, but maybe furthered the myth of vagina dentata. Um, and also legislation and courts and how it has been dealt with in the political world. For example, with Kesha, this is an image of Kesha, who tried to get out of her um, contract with her producer to, because she claimed that he was sexually assaulting her. And the judge basically said, actually, I value his financial interests more than your well-being, and so I'm not going to break the contract. And so she appealed, and the new judge said, you should have known before you signed the contract. That is the state of our courts, and is a story that happens again and again in almost every country. So that's the Society Gallery. And of course the History Gallery, I mean, it's, it is what it says on the tip. Uh, the history of gynecological medicine. For a very long time, doctors would not even look at it, so we wonder why it's so behind every other field of medicine. Um, the history of the science behind the gynecological anatomy. So does anyone know what that is? That's a vagina, according to Vesalius. Um, people genuinely used to think vaginas were just inside-out penises. Um, this is a cutout, I'll zoom out, um, because this is an image from a 1559 anatomy textbook. And I don't know if you can see, but uh, on the image of the, there's like a headless woman who has her, her insides on display and somebody cut out the vulva. And the book was found like this. So nobody knows who cut it out or why they did it. But because these are woodcuts by Vesalius, we have many other examples. Um, so this is what it normally looks like because they get reprinted all the time. That is what the vulva looked like. And I just think it's really interesting because her labia are poking out, her inner labia are poking out from outer labia. Um, I don't know, maybe they were just offended by this fact, but I love it. Um, the history of menstruation. I don't know if anyone remembers using these. My mum definitely used these, where before you had adhesive pads, you had to clip them on. The history of contraception. This is a real uh, um, comic sort of little thing where there's a stork carrying a baby and it says, and, the sti and still the villain pursues her. For as long as we've been having babies, we've been trying not to have babies. And of course, um, the history of vulval beauty standards. Very hot topic now, um, but was a hot topic always. As you can see, this is Rubin's Three Graces. So, as we know by the name, they are supposed to be the most beautiful women he could imagine. Number one, they have rolls of fat and cellulite, which is great, but they also don't have any pubic hair. And I think this is really interesting because people keep saying, oh, the removal of pubic hair is something that's only been happening very recently. It's actually been happening for a very long time, for hundreds of years, for loads of different reasons. So, that's kind of an overview of what I want uh, the museum to be. How will we get there? So we currently have a pop-up museum which is traveling around the country um, where you can learn about uh, all sorts of different things. We're then going to open an interim space. So if anybody in London, Bristol or Brighton um, has an empty building they would like a vagina museum in, uh, know that I'm on the lookout. And then once we've done that for a few years, then we're going to start building the permanent museum. Just, just to manage everybody's expectations. Here is where we're going to be having the, uh, some future places. We're going to be having the pop-up exhibition, if you would like to come visit us. And here are some events that we're doing. We mostly do them in London, but um, the On the Female Body one is in Manchester. Um, so that is kind of the cliff notes of the past year and a half of my life. Um, and I hope, after seeing all of that, th thank you so much for, for being with me through this journey. And I hope one day you can come visit and agree that the world does need a vagina museum.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence Schechter. Um, you'll be taking questions in the bar yeah? shortly after this. Yeah, the bar. Let's go to the bar. Do Q and A at the bar. Okay. Thank you. Um, and apparently we still need a lot of volunteers, especially for the car park, so if you haven't yet, um, you can volunteer on the EMF website, there's a link at the top, or visit the volunteers tent. Thank you.